What is narrative design, and why would you need a survival guide for it? That's what I want to explore today. But I'd like to start by pointing out that narrative design is one of the toughest crafts in the whole of video games, made even tougher by the fact that most developers don't even think that it's part of their process. What I'd like to do first is give you some context by which we can think about game stories. And I want to start with something you'll know, so I'm going to go with Breath of the Wild, because I suspect that some of you are familiar with it. If I asked you what the story of Breath of the Wild was, you might say, Link wakes up, one's about a bit getting stronger, then goes to the castle and kills Calamity Ganon. Or you might put the story of Breath of the Wild from Zelda's perspective. You might say, Zelda gets depressed and angry, then masters a power, waits a century, and defeats Calamity Ganon with Link's help. Now, those two synopses are fine as far as they go. But the trouble is, every video game has something right in the heart of its story to mess it up, right? And that's the player. The player doesn't always want to cooperate with your story. And the story of Breath of the Wild for most players is less either of those two plot synopsis than it is all the little anecdotes they have about their journey through the world of Hyrule throughout their time playing the game. Now, Breath of the Wild has been called an open world game. And when we talk about open world games, we're usually talking about the style of open world that GTA 3 set up and which has remained more or less the open world template since. I'm going to use San Andreas as an example of that style of game because I'm old fashioned and think that that was the high point of the franchise. Sorry, Rockstar. Uh, but the essential uh, idea is that the player moves through the world of the game, visiting various waypoints that trigger story events, and these story events take them gradually through all the places in the game world. In between participating with the story, the player's free to doss around doing whatever they like in the world. That's the open part of the open world game format. But as far as the main plot of an open world game goes, you're mostly just following this chain of waypoints from point to point to trigger the next story event. Now, if that is our model for what an open world game is in terms of its uh, narrative, then Breath of the Wild isn't really an open world game in that sense. Because the way that uh, the story is structured in the world of Hyrule for Breath of the Wild is that you go to four fixed places on the Great Plateau, and then the only other mandatory plot point is going to the castle to kill Calamity Ganon. We actually haven't seen a game with that open a narrative structure since perhaps Fallout, the original Fallout back in the day, which also allowed you to bang straight off to the boss if you wanted to and felt capable of surviving. But of course, that's not all of the narrative elements that are going on there. We also have a series of flashbacks located at different places in Hyrule which fill in Zelda's story. And in fact, I'd say Breath of the Wild is the first time Zelda has actually had a starring role in her own game. And the way it works is the player is given photographs of locations and is asked to solve the puzzle of where this location is by participating in the game world. And as you visit those locations, you get a flashback. Those flashbacks can be delivered in any order. They don't even have to be delivered. You can finish the game and never see a single flashback, right? It's a very different structure, I think, narratively, than the standard open world model. But what they both have in common is this situation that you are handed over uh, an avatar, a little digital doll for you to play with, and you're given a space to move around in. And the story, the overarching plot advances through the places that you go throughout the space of the story. Now, I like to say the narrative design is structural design. Both video games and stories have structures that they work by. Narrative design is the challenge of making story structures work with game structures. In an open world game of either of these two styles, what that essentially involves is taking the plot and folding it into the geography of the world. We might say that open world narrative design is plot origami. Right? You've got all the events that you have in your plot and story. You need to therefore make them work physically in the game world because that's where the player is going to be occupying. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chris Bateman. I'm a game designer, narrative designer, and writer. I've worked on more than 50 games. Some of them are even good. 
Last year, uh, my big releases were the PlayStation VR uh, title, The Persistence, uh, with Fire Sprite, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later in this talk, uh, and also uh, the RPG sequel, Shadows Awakening, which I had a ton of fun working on. Uh, the big release so far this year has been Tropico 6, uh, and I'll also talk briefly about an indie game I'm working on called Silk a little later in this presentation. I founded International Hobo in 1999 uh, after working on point-and-click adventures, largely because I had a feeling then, uh, that hasn't really gone away, uh, that we don't really know what we're doing when it comes to getting the most out of stories in video games. And uh, the sense that uh, I and my team had then and now was that the way forward was to try and uh, open a dialogue between conventional writing and game design. And this is what we call narrative design, right? It's this crossover between conventional writing techniques and game design techniques. And our way to come at it was to hire people who were writers with limited game design experience and hire game designers with limited writing experience and throw them together and force them to work together and start building up a common language for working on games. Uh, the term narrative design crept out into the uh, industry via the IGDA uh, games writing um, special interest group, which I set up back in, I forget what, the early 2000s, it seems like forever. Uh, but that's pretty much uh, where narrative design came from, as far as I can tell. I don't think anybody was using the term before us, and I think Richard Boone, who worked with me uh, at the time, was the first person in the world to have the job title narrative designer. I also do a lot of books, a lot of books. Um, I started writing sort of how-to video game books, of which the most successful was uh, Game Writing Narrative Skills for Video Game, which was written by members of the, uh, the IGDA's writing SIG. And then I picked up a bad philosophy habit in 2011, and I've been writing philosophy books in parallel to my game projects. Uh, the most recent of those, uh, The Virtuous Cyborg. Uh, this uses examples from video games to offer a new kind of technology ethics. If that sounds like something that you're interested in, please buy a copy of the book from me because my publisher requires me to pimp it at you. Uh, and also this year, I became the first uh, game writer to get an article in the Writers and Artists Yearbook, which I'm very chuffed about. Uh, I get to be alongside Neil Gaiman and J.K. Rowling, which is a sentence I never thought I'd utter. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just uh, finishing a deal with Bloom, uh, Bloomsbury uh, for a second edition of game writing, which we hope will come out next year. Right, that's all the pimping out of the way. Let's get back to the narrative design. So if narrative design is getting conventional writing techniques to work alongside game design, what are those conventional writing techniques? Well, as a, as a crude simplification, let's break writing down to character, plot, and theme. Right? Character, the people in your story, plot, the events in your story, and theme. Well, theme tends to get a little bit overlooked, particularly in video games. I like examples where theme is something that you can visualize. So I've got the example here of the Maltese Falcon, right? From uh, the Dashiell Hammett novel and uh, the Humphrey Bogart film adapted from it. Because the theme of that story is greed, and the Maltese Falcon, which is supposedly solid gold eagle, is this icon of greed that the story hinges around. So theme is about what the story is about beyond the events of the story, right? And great stories have great themes, although we don't do very well with that in video games yet. So how does this match up to game design techniques. What do we do when we're dealing with narrative design? Well, in the case of the character, we have an enormous problem to overcome in every single game. And that is, uh, we have the avatar, which on the one hand is a character in the game world, uh, but it is also a mask that the player puts on to enter the game world. And the way that the player wants to behave once they're wearing the mask doesn't have to be the way the character ought to behave in the game world, right? There's an invariable tension there between the mask and the character, which I'll talk about more in just a moment. The avatar moves around in the world, and world is super important for video games, way more important than it is for books and movies and TV shows. In books, movies, TV shows, the world is just a store of locations that the next part of the story goes on in. But the player moves around in the world and is free, usually, to move around in the game world, in a video game, and therefore free to mess up the pacing of your story entirely by going and riding a pony around Hyrule for 10 hours and not doing anything to advance the story, no matter how much uh, the little fairy nags you to push on. <laughs> 
And lastly, goals. Plot usually manifests in a video game story by the goals the player is set. Those goals require the player to go to specific places and do specific things, and that allows you to advance the plot, right? Those are the sort of general mappings between conventional story planning and the narrative design of a video game. But we'll need to dig into them a little bit. And let's start by looking at this tension between mask and character. There are a number of different ways that we can come at this. So, the standard play in commercial video games is a narrative design whereby the, <coughs> the player takes turns with the developer to play the character. And what that means is, the player uh, is, on the one hand, dossing around in the world doing whatever they like, and then every now and then they do something the developer wanted them to do, which is a miracle, uh, and they get a cutscene or some other narrative device which advances the story. So uh, we've got a sort of uh, a, 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 an agreement to share the avatar, right? The player plays the avatar for a bit and then hands it over to the developer and watches something uh, while the developer advances the story. This is a perfectly fine model, and it works really well. I don't particularly like it, but it does work. It's a very efficient way of coming at it, and uh, also works really well with a screenwriter who doesn't know video games very well. Uh, it's great for character and plot, because all of the things you want to do in your character and plot can be isolated from the player's interference and placed in the cutscenes where they have nothing to do. Trouble is, it's not very good for agency. The player doesn't have much agency over the story in these cases. And the way we tend to resolve that is to uh, give the player a, a nice illusion of agency by offering big choices at uh, periodic moments in the story. Uh, choices in video games work great. I use them myself. But it isn't much agency you're giving the player there. In particular, whichever way you go at that choice, all of those outcomes are plotted out by the team, right? It's a total illusion that you've got some sort of meaningful agency in the world when you make a big choice in a video game. All of those choices are planned out, just like a choose-your-own-adventure game book, right? But it works. Players buy into it. They've played the character. They've watched the cutscenes. They're engaged in the story. Those choices matter to them when the time comes. So what else can you do? Well, the other major commercial model uh, is this one, where the avatar's personality aligns with the player's desire for mischief. So in a GTA game, the player is usually given some loose cannon gangster character who, by giving that character, they then have free reign to go and beat up everyone, steal cars, and act like a general reprobate anywhere in the world, right? The character's personality is made to align with what we expect the player will do. And that works fine. Uh, Link has the same situation. He's a teenager, he's full of courage, which kind of just means that the player is stubborn, uh, but he doesn't really have much respect uh, for social mores. He quite happily smashes every pot that he sees just in case something valuable is inside it, something that the game makers mock the player for quite frequently. Samus has an even simpler solution. Uh, don't meet anything you might need to talk to. Yes, everything Samus meets is something to kill, which massively simplifies the narrative of a Metroid game. So in this setup, uh, we really do away with the character uh, beyond it being a, a cipher for the events of the story. If you want to do character work in this setup, your NPCs are going to be doing all the work for you. The player character isn't going to carry much story. You're fine for plot. Uh, because you can send the player around the world and trigger various events along the way. And it's usually great for agency, because you're letting the character be the kind of thing that most players are going to want to be in the game world, the player can feel a fair degree of agency operating in the story. Those are the sort of standard commercial models, by no means the only models. I want to contrast them with two more extreme examples from the other end of the scale, from art games. So, let's take a look at this one, which is, uh, well, both of my examples there, I've realized, are Anglo-American projects, right? They were uh, made in Britain, but the music was recorded by Americans. And everybody's gone to the Rapture and Proteus and games like it. The avatar is purely a witness. The avatar only exists so the player can witness something that's either happening or has already happened, and you're exploring it in retrospect. Uh, that is really not a good model for a, a commercial game project, but it's a very interesting starting place for an art game. It doesn't give you any kind of character. The player has even less uh, opportunity to engage with the character in that setup uh, than they do uh, in the uh, Avatar for Mischief. 
And it's ambiguous about plot. It's ambiguous about plot because, because you are merely a witness, uh, the way that you are moving around in the story world um, doesn't necessarily entail a specific understanding of the plot. In particular, if you're playing something like Everybody's Gone to the Rapture and you just bang around at, well, I would say high speed. It's actually very difficult to go at high speed in Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Uh, but at slightly faster than walking speed, uh, you can miss almost all of the events and have very little idea uh, what was going on with the characters at all. The ambiguity over plot is actually one of the more interesting things about this style. And it's ambiguous about agency as well. Uh, play, many players are likely to feel they have no agency in this setup. But you do have an agency in the space of the story. It's this agency about where you're going to go, when and what parts of the story you're going to engage with. Artistically, I think this is a really interesting case. Commercially, not so much. You're not likely to make a million dollar, uh, a million dollar selling, a million unit selling game rather, uh, on that kind of narrative design. Uh, and I've got another example which is probably better suited to art games than commercial games, um, which is this one, whereby the developer invites the player to become the character. And two good examples of this, uh, Tale of Tales Sunset. Uh, the scripted story is not so great in Sunset, but it's a brilliant gallery game. It's a game in which you get to look at artworks in different lighting conditions. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and it invites you to play uh, the character that the game uh, revolves around, as does uh, Yu Suzuki's Shenmue. Shenmue invites you to play, uh, mess up my pronunciation here, Ryo, right? That's probably wrong. It's best I can do, sorry. If you get on board with being Ryo, you have a fantastic time. It's a real interesting experience. If, however, you find Ryo's world to be frustratingly narrow, and many players did when they got to the back end of the story and were shifting crates in a warehouse, they were like, why am I shifting crates in a warehouse? This is completely ridiculous then you lose them, they fall out of interest in the story. But if you're into this idea of, of being this character, it can be absolutely fantastic. I had a great time uh, with Shenmue. I'm glad they lost millions of dollars making that game. This setup here, where the developer invites the player to become a specific character, is another really interesting one, uh, artistically speaking. Because the character becomes ambiguous, right? There's a defined character, but you're giving enough space for the player to take on that role. You're sharing the character with the player in a way very different from the standard commercial model where we take turns playing the character. It's fine for plots. You can advance the plot the same way you would anywhere by sending the player to different locations with the goal system. But it's ambiguous about agency because you can't do anything that you would like because some things are denied to you because your character would not do them. Because your character has a specific personality, a specific reason for being in the world. I think this uh, gives you a good idea of how just the decision of the relationship between the player's mask and the avatar's character already has you solving narrative design problems for your game. Now, chances are on a big commercial project, you'll stick to some familiar territory, right? If you're working on something smaller, something interesting, indie, art house, you've got options. There are areas to explore. There are different ways at coming at this relationship. Right, that takes care of the relationship between the mask and the character, at least in broad strokes. Now, the goals, the goals that were set involve the player moving around in the world. But what do they do when they get there? They take various kinds of actions. And those actions that the player has are effectively plot devices, right? In a story, when there's some situation, often a plot device turns up to solve it, like R2-D2, who is the Swiss army knife of plot devices, right? There's a problem, R2 has an attachment for it. That sounded really dirty. I didn't mean that to be dirty. So I'm going to give you a quick whistle-stop tour of uh, some suites of plot devices in various uh, familiar uh, game settings. So uh, in Legend of Zelda games from Ocarina of Time up to just before Breath of the Wild, uh, the avatar is given a helper character. In Ocarina, it's the incredibly annoying Navi. Uh, the helper character provides the opportunity for dialogue between the two characters, much imitated elsewhere. And you bang around your world, and the sort of things you can do are to acquire weapons to kill enemies and to acquire tools to overcome obstacles to reach new areas. And from Skyward Sword onwards, also to collect uh, items into a collection that you can use in various different ways, very RPG-like. 
And there's also various treasure, rupees to collect into ever bigger wallets until they resigned that feature, uh, quarter hearts to power up keys to access different areas. And MacGuffins, what do I mean by MacGuffin? The MacGuffin is the plot device that everybody wants. Doesn't really matter what it is, as long as everybody wants it. Right? The Triforces uh, links ultimate MacGuffin. The player can't do anything with it because its powers are so abstract you couldn't possibly make a game around what it does. So it's just the thing that you've got to get and that somebody else wants to get as well. That's your MacGuffin. You move around the world uh, via a variety of uh, mounts, uh, all of which tend to be red uh, in Zelda games, right? Epona, lovely uh, Rowan horse, K King of Red Lions, Red Loftwing. And there are a number of sort of stock characters. Ganon or Ganondorf serves as a villain. And then you've got uh, Zelda and her nursemaid slash bodyguard, Impa. Uh, and these core characters uh, are there to use in every Zelda game. And the thing with the Zelda game is it is a huge suite of plot devices, which means it costs a hell of a lot to make. Uh, if you're going to be making a video game, Zelda's suite of plot devices is a bad place to copy uh, because it'll cost a fortune to make this style of game. There's too much. It's great for the player that there's too much in it, um, but there's a reason that Zelda games don't ship very quickly and that Nintendo has to constantly hold them back and tweak them. It's this giant toy box you're giving the player. How about classic Tomb Raider, by which I mean British Tomb Raider. Remember when Tomb Raider was British? Yes. Uh, I think the last British link with Tomb Raider was when Rihanna Pratchett, who was a former international hobo writer, uh, worked on the reboot, but now we don't have anything to do with Tomb Raider, really, where we play it, but that's about as far as it goes. So we have our avatar uh, and a world, which is basically our world with a little sprinkling of magic. Uh, and we have weapons to kill enemies in the classic games, mostly animals, because apparently everything that draws breath wants to kill Lara Croft. I don't know what she did, but animals hate her. It's shocking. Uh, and the interesting thing about classic Tomb Raider is that the tools you've got are basically your ability to negotiate the environment, right? It's your clambering, scrambling skills. And you use it to overcome traps, traps which kill Lara over and over again in the classic games. Uh, Richard, who I mentioned before, was very disappointed that Tomb Raider movies didn't consist of Lara Croft dying over and over again, since that was what the games were about. Not much by way of treasure. Keys and buttons to allow you to get to new areas and health packs uh, to, to fill you up. And MacGuffin's following the classic treasure hunter tropes, which it borrows from Indiana Jones movies, which it is no secret is where we get Tomb Raider from, right? Uh, originally, uh, the main character was going to be a man, but they were worried about being sued. So that's why we got the oversized novelty-breasted Lara Croft in the early Tomb Raiders. It's a little bit... Sad, but uh, yeah, it's still good that we got a female character, even if her proportions were a little bit dodgy. Uh, and if she gets a mount, it's usually a motorcycle or something similar. And in so much as there are characters, there's this recurring butler. This is a much more strimmed down set of plot devices. It's not enormously rich in terms of your narrative potential, particularly because a large part of it involves dying as you try and work out how to overcome traps, but it works. It delivers the kind of story that makes sense for the kind of world that Lara lives in. And then a sort of modification of that model crops up in the original Assassin's Creed, right? So you've got Altair as your avatar, and you've got uh, your uh, Crusades uh, Middle East for your world. And again, you've got a small suite of weapons uh, to biff off the bad guys. But your, uh, your tools here are pretty much reduced down to this ability to negotiate the environment. But the brilliant thing about Assassin's Creed was this way that the opportunities in the environment are signaled to the player, right? So if you see white doves on the edge of a rooftop, it tells the player unequivocally, you may jump off here, there will be a haystack to receive you at the bottom, no matter how ludicrous it might be for you to fall that distance into a haystack. And that is enormously empowering to players and frees up their agency in the game world tremendously. And it really is the triumph of Assassin's Creed for me. I think it's really funny uh, that when they were uh, pimping it at E3 before release, they thought their USP was social stealth. Does anybody talk about the social stealth element of Assassin's Creed? No, no. This, this was the genius, the way that the landscape was coded to signal to the player how the world operated, to let the player inhabit that world more freely. Brilliant piece of design. Uh, not much by way of treasure, largely flags to pick up, and uh, keys operating by little repetitive missions where you beat people up for information. 
Uh, oh, and this is my big disappointment. Some people really like the mix of sci-fi and history in Assassin's Creed. I'm not one of them. Uh, and I found the arrival of the giant glowy egg plot device at the end of the story. Spoilers, sorry if you haven't already played it, but it's a bit late now. Um, I found that to be a pretty disappointing way of tying up the story. Uh, it, the problem is the animus, this thing that's invented so that they can have sexy, high-tech HUD elements in an otherwise historical game. Uh, again, some people love it. I, I could really have done without the framing story entirely, personally. Uh, you get a mount, you're getting quite a nice horse in Assassin's Creed. The new ones have got very nice horses. Uh, and, but not much by way of characters. I mean, there are characters, allegedly. Uh, there are these characters that you kill and then spend you 10 minutes uh, telling you your life story, which is very, very weird, and I'm not sure why we're supposed to care, because we just killed you, man. Just die. Just die. Please. Uh, but we have a mentor character, and the nice twist, again, spoilers, is that the mentor becomes the villain at the end of the story. He kind of has to, because there's no other characters that could possibly do that, basically. But this is a really elegant piece of narrative design, despite a couple of clunky missteps, right? It scales everything down to just what's going to empower the player's agency in operating in the world. Very nicely put together. And we might as well complete this set by looking at FPS. And I'm afraid it's going to have to be uh, Halo Combat Evolved. Uh, once again, we've got the avatar uh, and the helper character. I'm afraid, once again, we've got oversized novelty boobs. It's Cortana, now the irritating voice assistant for Microsoft devices, to go with Siri, the irritating voice assistant for Apple devices. Uh, but this helper avatar arrangement works well, and they've got a lovely world. They've got this lovely ring world to bang around. But uh, in terms of uh, agency, pretty much the player's agency in all FPS is, which weapon am I going to co use to kill who now, right? That's where the player's agency is. And although there's a few tools uh, to help out with that in terms of the layout of the environment and uh, a few power-ups that you can take, mostly in the FPS setup, uh, the uh, agency the player has and the, the personal story they're experiencing is just murderizing an ethnic minority, an alien race here, but orcs and goblins are also popular ethnic minorities to eradicate. Uh, they've got a great MacGuffin, though, in the ring world, which they admit they borrowed from Larry Niven. I think it's hilarious that they sent Larry Niven an Xbox. Bungie sent Larry Niven an Xbox and a copy of Halo Combat Evolved. He was 63 at the time. I really wonder whether or not he ever played it. Now... One of the real breakthroughs uh, of uh, Halo Combat Evolved was that the technology had gone up to the level that the player could be given more agency in terms of mounts than other FPSs had managed before. So suddenly you have this range of vehicles that you can occupy, and that's what really had uh, journalists uh, going crazy for Halo at the time. Although, I, I've got to be honest, everything in that game is obviously from aliens. The whole game borrows its art design from aliens really rather heavily. I mean, there's no reason they shouldn't. We already saw how Lara Croft basically comes from Indiana Jones. But, I mean, seriously, Larry Niven's Ringworld and aliens, jam them together, there you go, you've got Halo Combat Evolved. So, the lesson here is that the suite of plot devices that you give to the player, give them their agency in the world, and the stories the player is going to tell in that world will descend from whichever ones you're able to give them. Okay? You can have a very small set if you can use them cleverly. But most big budget games like to give the player a large range. Or give them a small set like in Assassin's Creed, but give them clever ways to use them in the environment. Now, the thing we haven't looked at is theme. So, let's have a look at this briefly. In terms of theme, uh, one way you can get theme into a video game story is to just do it in the story materials and not worry about how it fits with the game. Well, it's better to have a theme than not have one, so I don't want to, be, uh, to knock that approach. But if you wanted to be clever about bringing your theme into a video game, then you would want the game mechanics to also relate to that theme, which is very difficult to achieve. But one place you can do it is in the core loop, the thing the player is doing over and over again. Whatever it is that the player does over and over again, there's an opportunity to hang a theme on it. But how you do it is going to depend on how the story is structured, which brings us back to the maps of open world games from the opening. So classic old school arcade structure, linear sequential, right? Ghosts and goblins stop at various different points along a map. Fine for plot, terrible for agency, doesn't really give you anything you can do for theme because everything's just a straight line. Yeah? I love ghosts and goblins, don't get me wrong. It's just very difficult to make an interesting theme adhere to a linear structure. Then we've got uh, the Metroidvania structure, which was invented in 1986 by Metroid and Legend of Zelda. Now, 
That's a little bit weird. Uh, why do we call it Metroidvania? The first uh, Castlevania game to use this structure uh, that I know of is Symphony of the Night. Brilliant game, but it's 1997. It's 11 years uh, after we get this structure. So I encourage you all to give up uh, the Metroidvania uh, label uh, and just call it the Zeldroid structure uh, and admit that you know where it comes from. Uh, now this structure, I'm sure you know it, you get items that let you get into new locations and that allows you to explore more and more of the game world. Uh, fine for plot because you've got checkpoints you know the player will pass through when they get a new item, they can get to a new area, that's great for your plotting. Ambiguous about agency, because the player sort of has agency here, it's the agency to get lost and not really know what they're supposed to be doing next. And that sounds terrible. The players actually love having the possibility to mess up like that. Getting lost in a world is actually more fun uh, than we've perhaps given credit. Uh, in fact, Breath of the Wild was built on the idea of letting the player get lost in the world. And I think it is a really good opportunity for a theme because you're acquiring certain things and it's ambiguous what they are. All that matters is they allow you access to new areas. There's real opportunity to use this for thematic purposes. It hasn't been done that much that I've seen, but the opportunity is there. And then we come back to the open world. Now, I want to flag up two styles of open world. Uh, the GTAs descend from uh, early 1980s open worlds, Elite in particular, but also Mercenary, Lords of Midnight, Paradroid. These 80s styles of open worlds let you go everywhere and were the first games to really have this really open structure. And they inspire the later style open worlds, which sort of congeals into uh, your GTA style waypoint chain, which we also see in Witcher and so forth, right? The 80s style open world is actually terrible for plot uh, because all you can really do is have the plot of the framing story, the objective that you're going to complete. In Paradroid, murderize every robot, right? That's as far as your plot goes in that setup. Uh, but great for agency because the player is free to go anywhere, right? And not even just to get lost. They're free to bang around this world in whichever way they like. And it's ambiguous for theme. It's a really interesting one for theme. Uh, we don't tend to make games in that style anymore, but I feel like there's real opportunities for artistic, creative applications of theme in these worlds where you're free to move around and there's no chain of story events to occupy you. The open world with waypoint chain, uh, that gets you your plot and it gets you your agency because when you're not advancing the plot, you're free to operate in the 80s style open world style, right? So when you're taking a break from cranking the plot, you can go off and doss around in the world. Uh, it's not so good for theme, in uh, uh, my view, because the sort of story you tell with a waypoint chain is very difficult to reconcile with the player's repeated activities. The core loop in an open world game is very unlikely to align with what's going on in the story. Although, you are welcome to prove me wrong, and I would love counterexamples if you've got them. See me afterwards. Buy me a beer. Right, to finish up, I've got a few minutes left. I should like to talk about two projects that I've worked on and about the narrative design uh, that goes with them. So let's start with the persistence. So uh, this was with Fire Sprite. They're a Liverpool-based company. Uh, they uh, came out of the ashes of Sony Liverpool, and they're a fantastic developer. Uh, and it was really, I was really, really thrilled that they wanted to get me in on this project. They already had a really brilliant game. They had this uh, PlayStation VR horror roguelike right? And it's set on a spaceship and the decks are constantly reconfiguring themselves in that roguelike way, so it's different every time uh, you die and come back. But they really couldn't find a good way of, of telling a story with it. And uh, the sort of default option on the table when I joined the project was to have a series of logs that you would, you would get by going around. And I, I discouraged them to go down this route because I feel like if you're in VR, the last thing you want to be doing is sitting down and waiting for an audio log to finish playing. That seemed like not the best use of VR. So um, I thrashed it around with Firesplite over a number of uh, meetings. Uh, and, and laid out a number of options, and I was really surprised at how much rope they gave me. When, when you work as a, a sort of troubleshooter on projects like I do, and you get brought in to try and solve problems, usually the constraints are incredibly tight, uh, and so it's just a matter of finding which way you can move within the constraints. Price Bright were astonishingly open to all sorts of wild and wonderful uh, uh, options, which they let me take, which uh, was a real joy. Um, so what I did, uh, with their permission and support, was uh, rework the story so that it had two central characters. It's the avatar and helper set up, right? They're both um, disembodied. They're both uh, just recorded engrams running on two computers on the ship. There's a clone printer 
that can print clone bodies for one of these characters, the player's character, uh, but her personality is still stored in the computer, so when she dies, she remembers dying. So the way the game works, because it's a, a, a roguelike and you're going out and dying over and over again, is the player is dying and then being printed back into a clone body, having remembered everything that just happened. Normally in video games, we, uh, we have the soft reset option when you die, right? Lara Croft doesn't really die, it's only that the player failed. Uh, but in the persistence, you really die. You die again and again and again, and your player character is being ground down by the remortises of it. And so the thematic thrust of the game, as per the title Persistence, is this need to persist, to keep pushing on against the frustration and the depression of constantly failing against the impossible odds against you. I really enjoyed working with this, and the two actresses that we got in the studio, we got them in together, which you get a better uh, performance out of the voice actors if you can get them in together, but it costs a little bit more. Uh, they absolutely nailed it. I thought they did a brilliant job with this, and I was really pleased with that. The other problem we had to solve was because we've got the decks rearranging, and because the player can go anywhere, uh, trying to get a structure that would give us a, an ending to the story was a little bit tricky. So we took a leaf out of the corpse looting game, Games. You know, System Shock, Bioshock, games where largely what we do is loot corpses for some strange reason, um, and made the game about uh, finding the other crew members who are already dead uh, and recovering their DNA, because their DNA, for instance, lets you access certain systems uh, by bypassing security protocols. So rather morbidly, uh, this is a game not only about enduring your own death repeatedly, but also finding the crew members and uh, holding a sort of makeshift wake over each one of them as you find them. Um, like I say, they gave me a ton of rope with this one. I had a blast with it, and I'm really proud of the work that the voice actresses did bringing this to life. If you have PlayStation VR and you haven't played The Persistence, I encourage you to check it out. It's very different from most of what's out there, uh, and I think is a really interesting example. Of course, I would say that because I made it, but you know what I mean. Uh, and then at the, uh, at the opposite end of the budget scale, uh, here's this little indie title I'm working on at the moment. Uh, it's Silk. Uh, this is my tribute to Mike Singleton, who died a few years ago, who made Lords of Midnight and, and several other of the early open world games that inspired it. Open world games are a British invention, all right? Every single game in the 80s that had an open world was British, every single one of them. And GTA 3 was also British. Well, yeah, British, as long as the Scots stay with us a little bit longer. Please stay with us, Scots. Uh, don't abandon us. Um, yeah, British, open worlds are British. I wish the government had done more to support us, but... I'd better stay off my soapbox. Anyway, Silk, uh, we are going to be publishing with the Kings of Neo Retro, uh, Huey, uh, this year. Later this year, this will come out. So, what I'm trying to do in this game, on a very low budget, uh, but I, do, I don't know about you, I think if you're going to experiment with narrative design, do it on a low budget game where uh, there's less at risk. You don't really want to be risking you know, a 200 person company on a, an experiment in narrative design. Um, what we have is three million miles of wilderness. We think it's the largest handcrafted open world of all time. Uh, it's the, uh, the space between uh, Antioch and Damascus all the way to Lopnor Salt Marsh uh, on the borders of Three Kingdoms China. 200 AD, and the twist, the narrative design twist here is that there are no plot devices in the form of objects in this game, right? All the plot devices in the story are the advisors that you hire. Every option that the player has in the game comes out of the advisors you hire, the decisions you make, adding people to your caravan, and once they've joined, they're there for the rest of your game, uh, control the narrative space that you're operating in. So if something like Shenmue is inviting you to take on a specific character, what this game is inviting you to do is to put yourself into the world of 200 AD and wrap your head around these characters who live in 200 AD. And the more you understand how they think about the world, the more you can operate inside its open world. I've really enjoyed working on this. It's been a total luxury, uh, frankly. Um, but I, I don't know, I'm getting on as my hair makes apparent. Uh, and I feel like if I'm going to make any games that tribute to games that inspired me, I ought to do them now uh, before my first heart attack. Uh, so I, this is my, uh, my tribute to Mike Singleton. And I hope that those of you who are interested uh, in this sort of experiment in narrative design will check it out when it comes out later this year. Right, I'm almost out of time. So uh, uh, I want to leave you with four questions. If this is a survival guide, you should take something away to help you survive in the narrative design challenges. So these four questions are ones you can ask about your game project. Firstly, 
how does your story system align with the other game systems? I don't tend to think of story as the other side of the coin for games. I tend to think of story systems being one more game system, and they've all got to work together, right? How does your story system work with your other game systems? And what's the relationship between the mask and character, right? What are you inviting the player to do? Are you just inviting them to act out in this world? Do you want them to take on a character? Do you want to take turns playing the character? What's the relationship between the mask the player wears as they become the avatar and the avatar as a character in the game world? Which plot devices do the player use to tell their story? In the gaps between the plotted elements of your story, what kind of stories is the player able to tell? What are you allowing them to tell with their agency in the story world? And where do plot, agency, and theme emerge from your game structure? The way you structure your game is going to set you up options for the way the plot advances, the agency the player has, and for any theme that you might be able to tell in the level of the game. Now, as I say, you can also get theme in just into the story materials. But if games are an art form, and I say they are, then we ought to try and use every element of that art form at its creative best. And that means making the themes of the stories align with the game mechanics as well. My name is Chris Bateman. This has been the Narrative Design Survival Guide. Uh, thank you all for coming. And before I take a question, uh, a reminder, you've just received an email uh, asking you to rate this session. Please give me very high marks so I can earn maximum experience and level up as a speaker at Develop. Thank you. We've got about five minutes for questions, although if you want to corner me afterwards, I'll happily chat to you after the session as well. Do we have a question? Oh, yes. I got the impression you almost have quite a low impression of a player when they're interacting with your world. You sort of suggested them as like an agent of chaos. Do you not think there's a way to um, counteract that? I, I find where this has happened has been where you've been able to be invested in the world and the narrative without having to force them either to um, not be an agent of chaos by taking away their agency, or as you say, facilitating it by making the character itself represent the player and that sort of personality. Is there not a middle ground where you can encourage them to take it into their own hands? That's a great question. Uh, I'd start by saying, it's not that I have a low opinion of players, I have a high opinion of chaos. <laughs> right? I love that players are agents of chaos in the game. I wish we'd be more agents of chaos in the world around us, frankly. Um, but is there middle ground? There certainly is. Um, I think the thing is, something like a GTA, because it sells to an enormously broad audience, inevitably anything really interesting gets sandpapered off uh, in favor of just letting the player do horrible things to prostitutes or whatever it might be, right? But not every game is a GTA, and, and most games have that opportunity to invite the player to come at it differently. And I think a lot of the skill in dealing with that tension between mask and character, as, as you allude to in your question, is inviting the player to come along a particular path. And I think the challenge there is inviting them to come a particular way without sort of forcing them to do it. You want to give them enough room that they feel they can say no, but make it so that they want to come along with the character. And I think, uh, as you say, lots of games actually do that in really interesting ways. That was a great question. Do we have another one? You said that you don't think that uh, with the start of storytelling can sell in millions of copies, but do you not think that that's what the Dark Souls series has done? You've sort of got this great story that's evolved around you many years ago, and you're sort of going through the ruins of it. Okay. So um, Dark Souls does have an interesting story structure, but it is certainly not the Avatar as Witness, because you go and you kick ass in that game, right? And in fact, more than kicking ass, you go and you die in that game. You die and you die and you die. You are not just a witness, you're right in the heart of the events. But I know what you're alluding to, which is in the Dark Souls games, the story is largely, it is the backstory, it's already happened. You're coming into the aftermath of it. I think Dark Souls has brilliant environmental storytelling, right? It doesn't waste its development budget on a lot of cutscenes and so forth. It puts you in a world with a history and invites you to discover it. So I, you're right, I think, that there's an element of the player as witness in that, 
but it also has the player as a very active agent dying and killing in the foreground. So it kind of walks between those two elements. And I think narratively, uh, as you're highlighting here, that is one of the things that makes it interesting, right? Uh, it's got it's got a rock hard old school feel to it, but it's got this interesting uh, narrative design as well. I think it, uh, I, I'm really glad to see From have some success because I've been following them for many years, uh, and Armored Core was the only thing keeping them going for a long, long time. And it's lovely to see them now, you know, having tremendous success. So big they won't even talk to me anymore. Uh, that was another good question. We've probably got time. One more? One more. Yes. The awkwardly seated person there, right in the middle of the room. Hi. Um, uh, on the graph you had where you were talking about themes in different game types, uh, I don't think really in any of them you kind of highlighted any of them as having actually succeeded in representing theme mechanically. Can you, uh, even on ones when you said they could do it, you said that hasn't really been achieved. Do you have yeah. any examples of something you think has strongly achieved theming through mechanics? Um, yeah, it's a tricky one because really, uh, as you're sort of highlighting in this question, this is an area we're only just starting to explore. I mean, video games don't bother with theme most of the time anyway. Uh, so uh, we're getting better at having a theme in the first place, but we still haven't really started to explore linking that theme up with the mechanics, which is why it's a little bit difficult for me to give solid examples. But actually, bizarrely, even though its narrative is quite uh, thinned down in many ways, I do think Breath of the Wild succeeds in some respects on a, a thematic level. Um, I don't have time now to give you the full uh, run of that, but if you're interested in Breath of the Wild story elements, I have a five-piece blog on it that I wrote last year called Zelda Facets, which I'd encourage you to check out and then argue against. Uh, it's crying out uh, for, a, for, a, for a good argument against. Jed, Pred Pres uh, Jed Presgrove, who's a critic in the US, recently had a, a pushback against it, and I'd love some more uh, pushback from people who understood what I was talking about. So uh, yeah, check that out, and if you've got other examples where you think you've found games that have got this link between game mechanics and theme, I'd be very interested in it. That's all I have time for, but uh, let me thank you once again for coming. Uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. Thank you.